Hello everyone and welcome back to the Biff Rugby League podcast. Uh, first off, apologies to those who watch on YouTube today. Uh, for some reason, Discord didn't want to sort out our video, so we can't all see each other. So we're just going to record the podcast over the uh, over our logo, so you guys can still listen on while we're doing other stuff. If you watch on YouTube, for those of you that listen on Spotify, that announcement doesn't affect you. But thank you very much for listening anyway. Um, another apology from Toby, who can't be with us tonight. Um, we're recording late on a Wednesday, and he was busy both Tuesday and Wednesday this week, so unfortunately he couldn't make it. Which is a shame, Robin. Really, isn't it? Because we, there's a lot of there's a lot of North Wales Crusaders chat to have this week. Is, we've got a hot topic for our resident expert, and the league dog decided he's not going to show up. Oh, you, <laughs> you say you'll get you'll get a touchline ban and a, and a twenty thousand. Oh, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, how have you? Before we get into uh, Anthony Murray and a lot of the stuff we want to talk about, how have you been the last couple of weeks? Yeah, I've been good. I think um, like the the Super League season is sort of like ramping up towards that sort of finals talk. So that's been um, that's been interesting, and um, you know the weather's turned pretty good up here. So I'm in good mood. How about you? Yeah, it's good. I think it's nearly. I think it's still thirty degrees. It's twenty two degrees here, and it's half past ten at night on a Wednesday. Like. I'm not looking forward to the weekend. It'll be ridiculously hot when I've got loads of rugby on, but I'll be okay. Um, we better as well jump straight into it and get this out of the way. Anthony Murray is stepping down as head coach of the North Wales Crusaders at the end of the season. Um, he has a long association with the club and joined the Crusaders in 2014 and stepped in midway through that season as the head coach. Um, he led North Wales to an iPro Sport Cup, which I think was the old North uh, Northern Rail Cup uh, in Blackpool in the first season and was promoted I think in 2014 after that season as well so the guy's, the guy's been up there and uh, he, no, he went to cru- uh, all goals at the end of 2016 and then returned in 2018 and they just seem to have improved year on year under him I wonder it, it doesn't really explain why he's why he's stepping away in his statement um, yeah, that is really my question, like, what, what's caused it? But we don't know, nothing's come out. Yeah, it just says here, he comes with a heavy heart that I've decided to step down at the end of the season. Myself, Alan, who I guess is his assistant, um, I don't know who his assistant is, and the rest of the coaching staff would like to thank all the board members and support sponsors for their support during their journey. Our 18th man, our fantastic fans have supported our journey since day one, and without the Crusaders family behind the coaching staff and players, we wouldn't have had the success we've had over the last two seasons and before that. I've been very fortunate to have a fantastic coaching team around me uh, to work and create the right environment for our players and improve and succeed. But last but not least, thanks to our wonderful playing group. We have a special bunch of lads at Crusaders and we've loved coaching them, picking up some amazing victories and creating everlasting memories along the way. Please get behind the lads in the final three games as we aim to cement a good league finish with a final push in the playoffs and wherever that may lead us. Everett North Hearts would like to thank Anthony Murray and his coaching staff for all they've achieved during his time as the club head coach. There's a couple of interim jobs going in the championship. We know that Mark Dunning is at Bradford and he's still the interim coach from what I believe. Do you think this is lined up? Do you think this is him stepping down for a bigger coaching role? I mean, he's, he's, he's been pretty successful. I don't know what he's done with the, the, the club, so... Um... Yeah, I, 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 when, I, when I first saw the headline, I was expecting it to follow up with because he's going and doing something bigger. Yeah, it won't, apologies, it won't be Bradford. Mark Dunning had signed a, a deal back in January, uh, July, sorry, until November 2023. In that case, then, I don't know where else he would go. I don't know unless, unless Newcastle have said they're getting rid of bets or... Some championship clubs are getting rid of their players. It, it must be a job. There must be a job lined up for him somewhere, mustn't there? Maybe the Wales head coach job if John Kidd's stepping down. Maybe, but it'd be, it'd, I don't know because you, you, would say, you wouldn't expect him to be moving around like that just after the World Cup. I don't know. I think that he would be sort of doing himself out of a job with the next potential fixtures at Wales a long way away. So that doesn't make sense to me. It's, it's um, a weird one. I mean, there may be a, in a few weeks' time we may get an answer to this, and obviously, unfortunately, we can't speak to our our resident. Um, <laughs> our get, get local gossip. Yeah, well, hopefully, um, we can get some local gossip in the next pod, and we can and maybe we can sort of put, draw a line under that and sort of know where we're going. In in terms of League One, it wasn't something necessarily I wanted to talk about today, but 
they they sit second, fourteen wins, three losses. Obviously behind an unbeaten Keithley, one of the form teams. Two teams go up from League One. They've got to be the favourite to go up ahead of Swinton, Doncaster, and Rochdale, haven't they? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Keithley, we know will go up because they are the best team in that league. But North Wales in the championship next season, that's huge for them. Yeah, it will be, it'll be a, a challenge for them. Um, he's kind of. You know, a coaching change straight after a promotion is not, not the best idea, is it? Like you kind of you kind of want some st- stability so you can carry that forwards momentum with you and, and hopefully like catch a few of those lower um, table teams off guard. So yeah, I, I think I think they really, they've got what it takes to um, get that second promotion spot. Um, just as we were talking, then I've just I'm just had a horrible thought. What if he's um, if his next job's going to be in the uh, rugby union, we don't know, do we? Can, in Wales. Yeah, with, with, the, with the scene of the, the, how Welsh rugby union is coming along, and they're trying to obviously. It seems it sounds like a really bad way to sit, but what I've seen is that the union teams are really pushing, especially in the women's game, the union teams are really pushing to stop the women's rugby league team. If they're centrally contact rugby union players, they can't play rugby league over in Wales. Uh, it looks like that's happening over in Ireland as well. They're offering big deals to a lot of their sevens girls and a lot of their union girls, which might stop them from playing rugby league in the summer. Um, it's a massive, like said, it's a massive blow for Crusaders. So fingers crossed, they have someone lined up to take the reins and lead them to success in the championship. Should they go up this year? Surely they should. Yeah, they're, they're kind of if they. If they if they didn't, they would have um, dropped the ball. Really. Like this is a real good opportunity for them. They'd be missing out if they didn't take it. Yeah, hundred percent. And like we said, hopefully we'll get a, a, a view on to- Toby's point of view from this uh, in the next couple of weeks, or if we can, we'll get a statement out from Toby and uh, and we'll follow that story because it is going to be interesting to see where he goes. Will Anthony Murray stay in rugby league? Will he be going to rugby union? Like. Like we said, it's going to be very, very interesting. But we'll, we'll take a massive jump now to Super League. We're not going to mention much of the Championship this afternoon or this evening, um, just because we're going to mention that in a couple of weeks when that season sort of comes to an end. But the playoff race for Super League is absolutely massive. It's top six, isn't it? Or oh, top five. And from Hull KR up, not Warrington, because we know they're in a relegation fight, but Hull KR on 20 points. Hull FC on 20 points, Salford on 20 points, and you've got Leeds on 21, and Cass on 22. The top four is set. Saints, Wigan, Huddersfield, Catalan. The, obviously, Wigan, Huddersfield, Catalan might move around a bit with five games still to go, but from fifth down to ninth, there's a big gap. Like, Cass are even, the way Cass are playing at the minute, they could drop off. Hull KR with the players that they haven't got available, could be struggling. Where, who do you see missing out in that? In that group, which which play or which, realistically, which which one team do you think makes it ahead of the others? Yeah, I mean, um, Cass have been like quite a up and down team this year. They've, they've like pulled out some really good performances and then not followed up the next week. So yeah. that's a that's a, um, they've got every chance to get that fifth spot. Um, Leeds seem to be turning things around a little bit. Um, yeah, they, they've this squad, like, right at the start of this year, we, we expected Leeds to be to be up there. So maybe maybe over the next couple of games, things will even themselves out a little bit and um, they'll climb up. So they will be all over the place. To be honest, Hull FC, I don't think they've got it in them. Um, I think the last couple of weeks they've had some quite key games. Um, like the game against Castleford was quite a high emotion game because of, you know they have the Hull FC. Um, Players left Castor and vice versa, so that was one that I, I imagine with the fact that they lost, so, like tells me that they, you know, I think that would have frustrated them. I think they would have put a lot of effort into winning that. And that tells me that you know they can't, they maybe don't have, I don't have it in them to close out games that they need to win. Which you know, when it comes to the finals, is exactly what we need to be able to do. So I kind of don't really see Horace as too much of a threat. And I, I think Hull KR um, just don't, they just don't quite have the, um, they're, they're a bit of a lucky side, they create their own luck, but I don't think it's enough to, to carry them, considering we've got to overtake everybody that we've mentioned in that list. Yeah, um, I don't think it'll happen. I think realistically it's between Cass and Leeds, but 
Yeah, I'm sorry for this still a bit of a dark horse in it. I think the week could surprise a few people. Yeah, it's, it's, it's top six, and, and Leeds and Hull KR face off this weekend. And if Hull KR beat Leeds, they'll go above them. So they'll jump up at least one spot. We know that because they'll, they'll beat Leeds. Um, it's just, it's, it's very, very tight. Um, so we need to look at it and go, okay, two teams are going to get there. Three teams are going to miss out. I think Cass being in pole position have really got to make sure that they don't drop points now. Yeah, and they are actually, they have the, um, well, they've got a minus points differential when we're talking about these margins. It makes a difference. Like, who they are, they're on uh, that. Over, over 100 in the minus. PR compared to minus 189 for Hull FC. So realistically, you're looking out and going, okay, them two teams are probably not going to make it. Yeah. And Cass with the minus 15 points difference. You say they can't afford to drop points. They've got Catalan at home this weekend. If, if they yeah. lose and Hull KR win, they're at their level on points. Yes, yeah. they're still above Hull KR, but that's t that, like they're on level points then. So that, that yeah. point difference in that sense doesn't really come from it. Uh, Salford play Huddersfield they need to make sure that they pick up a good win this weekend and then it's Wakefield like Wakefield we think they've got Wigan and Wigan will drop down a little bit Warrington to lose and then Wakefield Wigan I mean Toulouse could do a number over Warrington this week Wakefield lose to Wigan and, and once again Wakefield the bottom of the table mm. are, we still, are, we, are we looking at the league fixtures that, that, that Toulouse have got left having to play I think Warrington and then after that pretty much everyone in the top five or I think four of the top six they're, they're in a, such a tough spot because we don't want them to go down, do we? No, we don't. We've been trying, we've been fingers crossed for pretty much every round this year that they'll get a result. And the, the, the strange thing is, is that we've come really close several times now. And I kind of feel like we're at that tipping point where it's too, it's too late, I think. Yeah. When you look at the fixes they've got left, I mean, I'm saying that the teams that were nearly surprised they sat at the top of the table yeah. so they could do it again but I kind of feel like when you get into this end of the year those top top four sides are going to be really building some form now and they, you know, I mean, they're not going to get caught off guard because they're going to their eyes around the finals and building a good um, bit of like uh, well momentum yeah, 100%. so uh, I don't think it's enough but I think that I think that Toulouse have had some chances in the year and they got off to they, they had some that chances really early on and I remember saying at the time this yeah, you know this could come back to bite them we didn't see this one out um, yeah, would, would you Wigan is the one in mind yeah would you like to see Toulouse beat Warrington this weekend and those three teams really battle it out because if Warrington win this weekend we know they're not going to go down but we also know they're not going to be able to make the top six so their next four yeah. if they win this weekend they know their season's over because they know that they're, they're, they're very very they're still would be mathematically possible depending on obviously if Catalan, if Castleford and Leeds both win then I don't think they'd be able to do it with four games to go but if you're looking at that and you're going okay they're seven points off Leeds now with ten games remaining they could potentially be nine points off with 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 eight, eight points to go not be safe but also be still be stuck on 14 points with both Wakefield and Toulouse on 12. But you look at that and go, is do, do we spoke on it a few weeks ago? Do out of those three teams, do we want Warrington down? Do we want Wakefield down? We, we know we don't want Toulouse down, but out of Wakefield or Warrington, yeah. would you rather I think... like Warrington go down and shock the world of rugby league a little bit, or would you just do we want Wakefield out of so not in a bad way? We don't mean to sound rude, but yeah. a team like Wakefield who. We know don't have the best facilities. We know don't necessarily attract the big name players. Do we, do we, does it seem like that need to take a drop down? But then you're replacing mm. someone like Featherstone. It's exactly the same team, right? Pretty much. Uh, um, yeah, so exactly. I think. Sport. I think my my view is that the, the promotion relegation is it's just a lose lose no matter what we do here, and so it's the lesser of two two evils or three evils. I think we need to lose to try and um, spread the game in France. I think. I think that that's been. Um, I think that, I think that we, despite the fact that we've not had a good year, I think we've had good crowds and people have enjoyed going there. And it's felt it's been a bit of a good news story watching this to the side. Um, you know the first French derby and all that stuff. Where it feels has been sort of a bottom table team for a long time now, so I think they're the obvious sort of um, choice. To 
think to put them down. I think Wellington are, are, have been a successful team. Um, big crowds, they can they can attract um, overseas players. So for the best the best option for the Super League is for Wakefield to go down. But having said that, Wakefield has been part of the Super League for a long time. Um, and I don't think that we deserve to be in the championship. It's a shame that, that we're going to have to see one of these three clubs go. And, um, you know, they just, you know they, I, I do actually think one of them deserves a spot in the Super League. Maybe we need to open up to um, 13, 14 sides. I don't know. But, yeah, I think I, I, this is the problem with promotion relegation is I, I think that the, the losers lose more than the winners win, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, t- I totally agree. I mean, you're looking at the teams that are going to come up. We think, I don't, realistically, if Lee, if Lee go up, they're going to go straight back down because that's what they always do. I don't necessarily think that's the case with Featherstone because the, le- the players they've got will probably stick around. They've got, they generally, in my opinion, do have a Super League level mm. team, whereas a lot of those Lee lads are on one-year deals on a lot of money and they'll move on if they don't go up. Um, and yeah. if they do up, they'll if they do go up, they'll probably still move on to to other clubs because they deserve to. Um, l- looking at the championship, obviously Lee are top, so we know that they'll go up. Fev thirty seven points. Uh, Halifax on thirty two went third after beating Batley on Monday night, who are still who are also on thirty two points. York fifth on thirty. Do you see any of Halifax, Batley, York, Barrow? Which realistically, we we, we stop at Barrow because there's a nine point gap between Barrow and Sheffield, so. Those top, yeah. top those th- teams in third to sixth, do you see any of them toppling Featherstone in the playoffs and going up? Like, do you see any of them beating Lee and beating Fev potentially going up in, and shocking these teams, one of those four? Uh, well, I can speak as a Yacht Knights fan and say that we don't have a good win against Featherstone. So, um, but even if we did, I, I, I'd like to say, I think Featherstone have a really good quality team and I think that they've known all year what this was about and so they're going to be they're going to be more stern and turned when it gets to the, to the finals I think they're going to be a really difficult side to beat um, I, I don't think either Halifax probably or York have, have it in them to, to beat Ferriston they might win a half you know, like they, might, they might win a course but I think Ferriston are a fit side with composure and experience now I think we'll be able to see out um, the game. So, I, yeah, I think we're looking at um, Lee and Ferriston for the Lee and Pan game for sure, but it will still be interesting to see who gets that third spot because I think all year it's been a two-horse race. Yeah. But to get to get best of the rest uh, in this league is, is still an achievement. So, there's still, there's still a lot to play for. Yeah, with, with three games to go... I think it's three games to go in, in that league now. Uh, maybe uh, four. It might be four. Right, hold on, I just need to. They've all played. They've all played eleven games. Uh, two games. Twenty-two games. Four more games to go. They might have twenty-six. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, twenty-six so, games. Realistically, any of those teams can catch Fev, who haven't necessarily been in the best of form. Like Lee, mm. Lee are the team to beat. We know that. Like they're always going to be the team to beat, especially when they bring in lads like Nene McDonald and. Like Blake Ferguson, who should still be, in my opinion, playing in the NRL. That's ridiculous. He's playing in second tier rugby over here. Like fair play to Derek Beaumont. We know he does a fantastic job. Would you like to see two up, two down from say next year? Like is that a, is that a thing that you look at IMG and you go, lads, look, one up, one down is is killing this game because it's the same teams going up, the same not necessarily the same teams going down, but Lee will go up one year and come back down. London have gone down this year. Went part. Oh, sorry. Went down a few years ago. Struggled to go back up. Went part time and have struggled this year. Like you're looking at Lee all the time. We one up, one down. Whenever Lee go up, someone else obviously goes up. It used to be Lee and London just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Do you do you see that being a case now? Where is it? It would be to lose and Lee, to lose and Lee, to lose and Lee for a few years. Yeah, I think. Yeah, like it's been a two horse race, and, this, and whichever team comes down from the Super League, it's still going to be a two horse race in the Championship next year. So I think there's a good argument for a 14 team Super League. Yeah. Um, but having said that, you know, like, like we're saying about Lee, they, they, they sign all these players on big deals for one year. Yeah. 
and then they, and then they just get relegated. All, all, all the talent that gets into the Super League seems to get picked off by the, um, by the Super League teams. And the, the team that actually ends up playing the Super League the following year isn't even as strong as the Championship side that they put forward the year before that. So it's not, in my eyes, it's not sustainable. Every single time that we do a, we promote a team, we get another, we, it, it costs our sport money. It, 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 values the league so no, if, I was, if I was IMG I, I would re-evaluate re um, how, how it's done I think the uh, uh, promotion motivation just, it's just not the way forward so I think to win the championship in, in an achievement the dream of Super League is almost a distraction because it's, it's, it's unachievable for pretty much all of these championship sides so there shouldn't be um, geared towards doing that in, 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 um, yeah, in that sense too. It's, it's too short term we're just looking at things soon and soon and really we should have long term plans that secure our game for you know yeah, you know what I'm trying to say right, so you, you're looking at we have, we have to find a way to make this game bring in as much money as possible but also keep it as attractive as possible so yeah, maybe we uh, um, think the promotion relegation side of things. Do we go back to like the super eights? I I didn't find the super eights. It was a little mm. dead ringer for the teams, maybe in eighth and seventh, who didn't have a chance of making the top four playoffs. But could you do a super? Could you just turn the super eights into the playoff system in terms of that? Um, and then like the first the team that finished ninth in super league could play the team who finished fourth in the championship or first in the championship whatever for a set quarter final do you, know, do you know what I mean so the team yeah I know what you're saying it, like it feels like we always get to a certain point in the year where we know certain teams have nothing to play for and it sort of like takes the sting out of it but I think that like, we managed to get around that in the Premier League how many teams are in that so that in 20 years so and they'll be, they'll be like teams that We've got, we know, there's nothing to play for for like months. Yeah. And they still managed to um, sell out stadiums and it's worth going to watch. So, um, and I, I, I'm cautious because Lee and Featherston are two clubs that they haven't got a real well fan base. And like, they, have, they have made the championship interesting this year because they've brought in some names that you wouldn't really expect to have seen play in the championship. So, they, they should be rewarded in some way for doing that. You know, they've obviously got owners that are, you know, dreaming big, and they shouldn't, they shouldn't be, like, holding them down. Um, it's just making sure that it's sustainable. I don't think, um, I'll be honest, I don't think the race is the answer, because I think that that's too much unpredictability. It's, yeah, it's, that was a problem they had before, wasn't it? The unpredictability. Of the trying, trying to get a long-term sponsorship deal when you're saying... We don't know what league we're going to be in at the end of the season. By the, the bottom third of our competition could all go down. It's too. It doesn't. You can't build for the future on that. There's some balance in the middle that gives teams something to play for, and yeah. um, it is. It's predictable. It's difficult. I don't. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe there's, there's some kind of um, competition that happens. So like a plate or a, a yeah. or something for. The teams necessarily not in that that, that 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 bottom four could then go into a, like a mini league for a, like the super league, like the super league plate or something like that or some yeah, just some because yeah. the thing is the end of the day uh, I believe that rugby league is enjoyable enough as a game on its own. I think you can go and watch a game and not know whether it's a cup game, a league game, a friendly, what a charity match. It doesn't matter yeah. what the bigger picture is. You can just enjoy it as a spectacle on its own. I totally so we can't, we can't, we can't, there's not a, a massive need to dress it up, no, no, but it's yeah. difficult when you've got players that are moving on and nothing to play for. Yeah, no, speaking of, speaking of not a lot to play for, um, we're going to move over to the NRL now. The Bulldogs, the Bulldogs, the Knights, the Warriors, the West Tigers and the Gold Coast Titans, none of them can make the top eight now. So they've got four games now where, apart from... You're probably looking at Warriors, apart from the Knights and the Bulldogs, Warriors, West and Titans are fighting for not finishing bottom of the table. I mean, four games left, 
Four points between Titans and Warriors, six points between the Bulldogs and the Knights. The Bulldogs and the Knights will be fine. They're not going to finish at the bottom of the table. Um, the Titans look like they were coming on strong under Holbrook, but they're underneath West this year. Uh, away form, they've not won an away game in 10. Uh, home form, they've lost seven out of their last 10 as well. They've only won eight games all year. Like their, their recent form, they've lost four on the bounce. The Warriors have lost four on the bounce. Uh, Wests have won one in their last five, which was, I believe, two weeks ago. The Knights are the same. Does that competition... I know they're bringing in uh, the Dolphins next year. That makes a 17-team league really stupid because it's an uneven number, but we won't get into that as much. Do you think they need to bring in another team to make 18? That's a massive comp, but obviously we know there's no promotion relegation in that league. Yeah, I think they do. I think I think they need another team because the one number means that we one team one team each week with the buy. Yeah, that sounds great. But what if you're the team that has the buy in round one? It's a bit pointless, isn't it? Yeah. You know what I mean? What if you have the, the buy in the last round of the game and really you could do is keeping your handy and keeping like, the momentum going for the finals? So the first goal is uh, an even week team. I think that um, there's enough talent in Australia for them to have um, 18 teams and I, I would use this as an example of why promotion and relegation isn't the best way of doing it like we've, we see teams that sort of like drop off a little bit sit down the table but and then they kind of offload some of their more expensive players that maybe haven't um, achieved what they wanted and then they pick up the next round of um, it's round of like unformed players that have come from teams that are sort of doing really well and can't afford to keep everyone and the cap keeps this like cycle going and because there's no fear of relegation clubs can go we're not going to make the finals this year we're not going to make the finals next year but the year after that we're, we're building towards and but you can't do that in Super League when every single year you've got a fear of the league being pulled from underneath you so yeah 100%. Um, we're going to move into the, the top half of that table. Penrith, six, six points clear, four games to go. They've got Melbourne at the weekend, so we, obviously we'll predict that game a little bit later on because it's one of our set of six. Does it, both Cleary and Luai are out until the playoffs. So they've got four games without Cleary and Luai, and they've just absolutely dismantled, I can't remember who they played in round 20. They just absolutely dismantled the Raiders. Another, another thing I was going to talk to Toby about was the Raiders are sat ninth, now, they should have been, in my opinion, in the top eight, to, and they should have beaten the, the Panthers. But do you think the fact that Cleary and Luai both being out means they can stay fresh? Do you think anyone is going to beat them at all again this year? Do you think they might lose a few games before the playoffs, but no one's going to beat them in a, in a playoff run, are they? I know you've got Melbourne and Roosters and that, but the Roosters and the Broncos and the Rabbitohs might still even miss the, the top eight, which is, which is crazy when you think about, like, the Roosters and the Rabbitohs and the Broncos. Yes, you can see where the Broncos have come from, so fair play to them if they finish ninth. But the Roosters and the Rabbitohs are finals teams, aren't they? Yeah, well, I, mean, I, I don't know the stats, but I'm pretty sure I'd, I'd be confident to bet they've been in the finals every year for the last eight, nine years. So, um, yeah, that's definitely... Um, it's a real interesting like, sort of table. You're not expected to see North Clinton but there. Um, and Cronulla, like, I think we, we did sort of say we like this team and they're going in the right direction, but they're, they're sitting higher than I would have uh, predicted. So, yeah, I, um, I can't remember the prediction that we had for some of these teams, but um, we, we, we did think about, like I think you guys said, oh, look, West won't make the top eight, and I was very, pretty happy with that, but I didn't see them finishing as low as 15th. Um, yeah. we, still, we thought the Knights and the Titans were going to be better than what they are, the Titans being bottom of the table. Um... <sighs> My, my question to you mainly is what happens at the Roosters if they don't make the eight? Like, if they, if they drop out of the eight and someone like the Raiders, the Sea Eagles probably won't because there's so much stuff going on. But if the Raiders or the Dragons get into that top eight, probably most likely going to be the Raiders get into that top eight ahead of the Roosters. Like, what happens to a lot of their new players that they're going to bring in? Like, Gildart's just gone there to try and boost his chances of playing in the World Cup, which I think, I think he's in the squad anyway, no matter what, because of the type of player that he is. But if they miss the eight and he's not playing playoff rugby, what does what does he do there? Like because he's on loan until the end of the year, he's not going to get as much game time as he might have wanted, and that's going to really hamper his chances. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that when, if, if you if, if you know you're not going to make the finals, why why bother um, playing a loan player when you can be sort of uh, 
um, given some some younger uh, players a, a debut or something like that, and sort of looking to have next year almost. Um, but I, I kind of I think I think some will, will get there. Yeah, they're, um, they're the best form in the comp. They've won their last four on the backs, and they've got they have got the Cowboys up this weekend, which which um, I don't know if I've got it in one of the set of six. Uh, no, I don't. I don't have that anyway. It's one of the set of six. So, like, if they beat the Cowboys this weekend, the Penrith, Penrith have wrapped up the, the minor Premiership because no one will be able to catch them. Uh, if, especially, if they beat, especially if they beat Melbourne, it might still be six points with three games to go and a little bit tight. But um, um, mathematically speaking, you're looking at pa- Penrith. They've won. The, they've won the minor Premiership. The Cowboys being second, Sharks third. That's huge. Well done to them. But this is probably one of the tightest. Playoff situations you'll ever see. We, like, who, who, who do, you, who would you like to see in that grand final against? We presume it will be against Penrith. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of feel like this year, like, like Melbourne's taking a bit of a backward step, uh, Rabbit's taking a backward step, whereas Panthers are still the same. So I don't think we've got that sort of like um, hardened challenger who genuinely is a threat. I think like. The Cowboys have, have, have sort of like had this like complete turnaround, um, but like we've seen the team, the team that gets to the final, it's all about experience. It's like if, if the team's got there it's the first time, generally they, they don't deliver. You know what I mean? I mean the only the only exception I can think of in recent memories, um, Ben Cunnell made the final against uh, Melbourne. And they, and they overturned it. But that was a year where Kamu were playing something that was totally different to everybody else. And they were sort of just, they just had that thing about them. And I don't see that in any of these sort of other sides in the top eight. So it, this year really is painless to lose. Um, like you said, the fact that they can play without the two um, playmakers and still um, completely dismantle the kind of defence means that the systems that they've got in place are bang on and is so they've got the winning formula right now and it's only um, made even more potent when they have world class players in there. They don't even need the world class players to be that good because the system will always support that. And, I, and that to me is a, a finals winning team. I don't see that kind of um, structure in any of the other um, challenges, so um, I would love to see someone different up there. I always like to see a different team. I, I really like the Sharks team this year, um, and the Cowboys are a great story as well. So for me, I might see even those two up there, but I wouldn't be surprised if um, I mean any of that you know, top top six get there. So it's challenging. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I think, in my opinion, I'd, I'd love to see. Uh, the Broncos up there, like we, we look at the seasons that they've had previously, the last two, three years, where they've been, like, I think they picked up the wooden spoon or nearly picked up, they were so close yeah, to the they did, yeah. season or the season before. And people are like, what the hell is going on at the Broncos? Especially with the new Dolphins side coming in to play out of that sort of area. Like, we were like, what's going on? Like, yeah. are they going to be the best team in Brisbane at this rate, like, with the second team? Potentially coming in at Brisbane, but it, it, it's going to be really interesting to see, and I'm sure in a couple of weeks we'll pick up on the fact that the fi- some of the finals positions will have, will have been sorted. We know that, and we, we really get to di- delve in and, and, and jump into playoff rugby league, which is going to be absolutely fantastic. Um, with the end of the season coming up, it's also we're getting closer and closer to the World Cup. Um, since we last spoke about the England World Cup squad, like in depth, we've had a retirement internationally from Jermaine McGilfrey. We've had Dom Young. Uh, choose Jamaica, which means England have lost two wingers. We've all, but we've also had Victor Radley uh, uh, say that he wants to play for England. So, and we've also had Sam Walker say that he won't play for England. He wants to play for Australia. So, obviously, that's a little bit disappointing on the Sam Walker front with him being born in England. Um, I was thinking that we could, he could be one that we can convince. And I mean, if he's not picked for Australia and he doesn't play, we, we've obviously still got time to maybe convince him to, to jump over. Um, before we go into the England, actually. Kiri has said he will happily play for Ireland at the World Cup. That's ridiculous. Like we spoke about, I think it was Kiri to consider Ireland's call, but then last week he announced that he was happy to play for Ireland at the World Cup as long as he is selected. That's huge for the Wolfhounds, isn't it? Yeah, massive. It was a, 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 yeah, he's been there, he's been there. Um, and it was, if you 
still can you still enjoy free? Um it would be a great addition to our island team. I think um Guy is the current island half back. I don't know what it is at the minute. He's been for a while, isn't it? Yeah, he's, yeah, he's, I, think, I believe it's Joe Keys right now. Halifax, which is Halifax. I think you've hit Keary playing alongside Joe Keys. Like that's that's massive, massive for someone like Joe Keys. Only twenty seven yeah. years of age, or twenty six years, twenty seven years of age. That a World Cup against uh, playing with one of the best halfbacks in the world. Yeah, and I, and I think the difference between Keary and Walker is that Keary kind of knows that he's he's not going to get that Australia shirt, so he can start looking around. Um, Whereas, I mean, Tom Walker's not even a shout, but he's, maybe he's thinking long term, thinking that yeah, over the course of his career, he'll get there eventually. But yeah, it'd be interesting. Yeah. To really yeah. he's, he's definitely going to get picked for Ireland, and, and fair play to him. I look, I look forward to, to that, and I look forward to, um, to the head coach, Jed, seeing what he does. Um, we, we mentioned Victor Addy before we move on to anything. It's something that I was really hoping for. And I've been hoping for since we first discussed the World Cup, probably in one of our first live shows over a year ago now. Victor Adley will play for England at the World Cup. Um, his father hails from Sheffield. Um, and apparently it creates a real selection poser for Sean Wayne, according to Gary Carter, uh, who I believe is a rugby journalist for The Sun. I know he's a rugby journalist. It's just whether I think I think it's for The Sun. Um, so if people uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if you know. I don't think it causes a massive selection headache. I mean... We were we were struggling to find another second row or centre to or uh, loose forward slash hooker to sort of go in that role. I think he saves. I think he solves the loose forward problem in terms of he is an out and out loose forward, which means Morgan Knowles doesn't necessarily have to put in eighty minute shifts in the middle. But it also sort of helps us at hooker. It means that the likes of Daryl Clark or whoever is your number one hooker get a little bit of a break because Radley can play there. But we know with Radley's discipline record in the NRL that he's a massive liability, so he might even get banned before the World Cup comes around. Um, let, forgetting his sort of discipline re- record, are you happy that we've that he's stepped forward and gone, I want to play for England? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy. I, I think it was a mistake about the before, and I was getting a bit frustrated about Sean Wayne saying, you know, we only want English born players, and like, who who you need to say that? <laughs> when you've got like, the World Cup players saying, I want to play in your team, yeah. So I'm glad that um no, I, I do, I'm sure I'm going to say he's gonna pick him as well, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think I think uh, yeah, that, yeah. he will be in the squad. I mean I don't think it would have been announced if he hadn't I mean he's had a yeah. connection with Sean Wayne. Sean Wayne's gone, I want you to play, he's gone, okay then I'll play. So it kind of it's kind of selected itself. We know that he's gonna be in the yeah. squad unless unless touch wood um he gets injured or gets banned and but we know that he's gonna be in and around that team. I mean he is very very I think he's still only twenty four. So he's probably got this World Cup and another two World Cups after that still in him. Yeah, 24 years of age. Only, only three months older than me, for God's sake. Like, like he's, yeah, I'm, it's, it's just scary because he's such a quality player. He's, he's mid. I'm so glad he's playing for us. And it would have been a shame because I'm not sure that we would have got in the Australia squad. So we would have just like, not had him at the World Cup. And when he's, when he's such an um, entertaining and um, aggressive player, that the exact types that are perfect for these sort of short format competitions so I, I, I'm super happy and I know that you're, you're very smug about this as well because you, you were shouting up about this like months and months before anyone picked up on it. Okay. It was all news to you. Yeah, it was, I knew it was coming. I was like, there's no way. Like, it, with his record of his disciplinary, I didn't think someone like Mal Meninga or even whoever's selecting the Australia team, I don't even know who it is at the minute after the state of origin, um, like eligibility the back that they've been going on over there but I've been banging on about it for ages and it's a shame like I said it's a shame we don't have Sam Walker but it also means we don't have to play Jackson Hastings at loose forward does it Robin so well right. I mean and maybe that's the selection header that Gary Carr's on about <laughs> I mean if it is then Sean Wayne is obviously not doing a great, great job uh, speaking of Jackson Hastings before I go on to the the wingers situation we were talking about a minute ago there's a rumour that he's coming back to Super League I mean, in my opinion, I think he the West Tigers fans want him there. Yeah, um, I, I think I think he's done a great job for West. He's been there what a year? This is his first yeah. only year. I was really hoping he'd stick around more, but I don't think. I think for some, I don't know what it is. Whether it was the fact that he only signed because it was Michael Maguire, which I think we'll talk about in a few weeks with like NRL contract issues, or maybe even after this. Um, <laughs> it's it's a shame because he signed a two year deal, I believe. 
I believe he signed a two year deal. So if he was to leave after one year, despite the fact he's probably been one of West Tiger's most consistent players this year, <laughs> would you be disappointed if he left? Yeah, I would. Um, I, I, I really like him and I've spoken loads and loads about why I like him and what the job he's done, so I won't go too much into that again. But um, I think it's, if I was a West fan, I'd be really, really, really concerned by this because when, when you get somebody like that playing the team, um, and like I say, he's contracted for a long time and he's sort of thinking about leaving or where, going back to the Super League, it just tells me that you, you could, I haven't got what it takes to return key players and for the long term that means that we're going to be bobbing around at the bottom of the table, which is what we've seen from West for a long time now, so, um, yeah, not, not good, I mean that, from a selfish point of view, I wouldn't mind seeing him back in Super League and getting seen a bit more, but honestly, I think his, I think his talents are too good. I think he, I think he deserves to be in there like that, and I think he's actually makes a, a massive impact on the game. So, um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe he's testing the waters. Maybe he's seeing how whether he can get, a, um, you know, a bit more money on his deal. Maybe he's just seeing how flexible he is going to go. Yeah, mate. Relax. Yeah, you know, I don't think he'll earn more than that. In, he wouldn't ever earn more than that in Super League because of the salary cap issue that they have. But it, it, I think if he need, if he wants, oh, oh, yes, I'm yeah, I suppose. I find the end. I'd rather pay him a million pound than Luke Brooks, but I think we've got another year of that rubbish. So we'll move yeah. on. Um, wingers. Dom Young has chosen to play for Jamaica, and Jermaine McGilvery has retired. They when we selected our team a few months ago, um, we said it's one of them are in the squad. Because they're yeah. similar. I think we said McGilvray has to start, but then if you take McGilvray, you take one of Ryan Hall or Dom Young. I think this situation needs Ryan Hall 100% in that England team now because of the type of winger that he is. He's really similar to McGilvray in terms of the power he offers. He's really similar to Dom Young in that sense as well. And we know he scores tries for England. Is it disappointing that McGilvray has retired before this World Cup and is it also disappointing I mean Dom Young is guaranteed to be at the World Cup and I think we mentioned this before, a, a couple of weeks ago but it really sort of it make, it probably makes it more of a selection headache at winger now doesn't it because you're looking at Liam Marshall Ash Handley um, Tom Johnson I think has been injured this year again which is a little disappointing to see and then Ryan Hall they're your four wingers really and, you've, and you're probably taking what three of them maybe four of them Maybe them four. Do you, do you see anyone else getting in ahead of any of those? Uh, do you see Tommy Makinson as well? Sorry, I forgot about Tommy Makinson. Tommy, Tommy, yeah. You've got Tommy Makinson, Liam Marshall, Ryan Hall, Ash Hanley, and oh, realistically, that's, that's your four wingers, isn't it? Mm, and I, I, honestly, I, 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 think, I, don't, I don't think any of them would make a dent in their arrow, so I don't think that wings are... <laughs> We haven't got strong wins in this in this competition. Could do it. I think I think with the way he plays, it reminds me very much of Pat Richards as well. With especially with the, when it comes to the goal kicking and the time. I mean, Pat Richards went over there and won yeah. the era with West back in I know it was back in two thousand and five, and then came over here and, and did it for a yeah. time. Um, he's definitely he's definitely got the experience, but I don't know if he's I don't know if he's got the size. So um, I feel like. Mokinson is for me, Mason is absolutely in the squad and is the best out of his ever choice. So it's, like, it's almost the next the next um, real winner, which is, is hard to choose. Looking at the try scoring stats for Super League now and ignoring Bevan French and Willie Ice, uh, and Ken Sia, who are well above the rest. Uh, Liam Marshall's on 18, which is the same as Jai Field. Obviously, he's not English, which is a shame. Uh, Tommy Makinson on 17, Ash Handy on 16. The next best English uh, winger. Is Daryl Olfitz on 15, Joe Burgess on 14, Matty Ashton on 13, and then Darnell McIntosh on 12. Uh, and Ryan, Ryan Hall's only scored 11, so realistically he's not going to be in the squad. So your fourth winger is going to be Daryl Olfitz, Joe Burgess, or Matty Ashton, ahead of, like behind Marshall, Makinson, and Hanley. They're not impressive. We know Joe Burgess isn't as good as what he was because he went over to the NRL, he didn't do it. Matty Ashton's young, up and coming, he could do it. And Daryl Olfus is it's full of errors. But we know he's full of yeah. errors. Yeah. A couple of months at pass during the middle of the season. Like, 
Do we do we look at maybe Wells being there? Do we have to move maybe a centre out? Or what what would you do if you were in Sean Wayne's position? Would you would you be speaking to Dom Young and be like, look, I want you to come and play for England? Or do you think that ship might have sailed now for this World Cup, knowing that you're going to get him in probably in four years' time? Yeah, I think I think Dom Young's made his decision. Um, so I probably wouldn't go down that route. But I think I think there's something to be said for for Wales being. Um, it's a, it's a really difficult one. There's no there's no name that really stands out in that list. I mean, Brian Hill's got the experience. I think like the Australians respect him, but you know, he couldn't do anything in that role. Um, I don't know. Maybe maybe they're an off dog. Maybe he sticks someone out in the ring that is usually a fullback. You know what I mean? So some, something like that um, might be might be our best option. Um, I don't know. I really can't. Yeah, it's what I mean. there's, there's quite a few holes in this England side, and I'm very feel very confident in our in our backs. So, um, no, um, I don't particularly feel massively confident in sort of where our back. I think forwards wise, we've got a pack, a pack to deal with many a lot of forward packs, and I think we always have done. We've never really been short on prop second rows, loose forwards, and I mean we're a little bit short on Hooker. I think he still needs to maybe get in the ear of James Roby. Um, that's something we need to do um, but we'll see I think in a couple of weeks we're going to do a re-pick of that squad and see because um, we said we would do it towards the end of the season but just need to find that we don't want to have to pick it we want to make, make sure we pick our squad maybe a day or a couple of days maybe a week if we have to before Sean Wayne picks his uh, women's rugby league time now and we're not going to talk about the women's super league in terms of the north we're not going to talk about women's super league group 2 we're not going to talk about anything up north it's Super League South playoff semi-final weekend. Uh, game number one, you've got the uh, Cardiff Demons versus the Army, but it's at the Army. So Cardiff are down as the home team because they finished second in the league, but the venue is at the Army Rugby Stadium. And then you've got London Broncos versus Bedford Tigers at uh, half past five at the Cherry Red Record Stadium after Broncos versus Workington in the Championship. Then, I'm going to run you through the league table quickly. London finished top unbeaten five wins out of five but will run very very close by pretty much every team they've played they didn't really have they they they, they scored 204 <laughs> apart from their game against oxford and their game against bristol they very run very close by both bedford army and cardiff um conceded 76 points so their points of was 164 they beat cardiff by two points they finished second they scored just under 300 points and only conceded 32 and they've got the army who their points difference was 10 and then but Bedford Tigers were second who, and their only wins were against uh, Bristol and Oxford who was technically a walkover this is these are big semi-finals because I'm, I'm a Bedford Tigers I'm, I'm, we all know that and I see how these girls are training every week and how they're playing every week and I know for a fact that they can beat London like we know we can um, Cardiff I think will dismantle the army they will beat the other team in the in the semi final. Are you excited? Are you going to make, are you going to try and make sure you're watching these games? Like both games will be available to stream on the day. The army is streaming theirs on Twitch, and obviously London Bedford will be on our league. I'm not sure if it's free. I am going to try and find out while we talk. Mm. Yeah, I think the, uh, I, I, I really I really like the women's game at the moment, um, and like these these four clubs are. Um, I've, 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 I've learned a lot since we've done our podcast together and we've talked with me about the Women's Super League South. Um, I know, like, like you say, in the Army probably aren't going to put in much of a fight. And I, I, I don't know if that's because of, um, you know, they don't always have the best squad available. It depends who, who's, who's available each week. Um, but Cardiff are definitely a team that, um, I know that you, I know that, um, they're strong. So, um, I, I kind of, it would be, I would kind of like to see a, a Cardiff team win in the rugby point of view because it, it might, might boost a bit of... Um, they won it last year. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I feel like, it, I feel like they're kind of, if you keep up this sort of like, we've got a champion team in the, in the capital city of Wales. Mm-hmm. I think it's a really good thing, but like, you know, like we don't need that in London as well. <laughs> no, no. They're, all, they're all great clubs. Um, and obviously I've got a very... Um, 
feel obliged to support the Bacon Tigers any, anywhere I can, so... Thank you, thank you very much. Um, but no, it's a massive day for, for women's sport on on Sunday. You've got women's, so you've got three live games that are being streamed. You've got two on our league, which are free. Uh, so you've got York City Knights versus Wigan at 12. And on Twitch at half past uh, three, uh, 3 o'clock, I believe it is, you've got the Army versus Cardiff. And then at half past 5, which is also free on our league, you've got London Broncos versus Bedford Tigers. <laughs> Um, my opinion, I'm really happy about it, but the, the girls are playing after London Broncos versus Workington at the Cherry Red Record Stadium. Like, it's going to be one of the biggest grounds that probably any of these girls have ever played at. I know they played, to, they played against each other at Ealing last year, but this is a brand. This is a proper. This is a proper stadium with four sides, proper nice grounds, and it, it really it's it's going to be. It's a Premier League football stadium in the making, isn't it? It's, it's a good, it's a good um, stage for them to perform on, and I think it's, um, I think it's clever as well that they're after the um, working to match because I think it hopefully fans will hang around and get them and stay to watch the game. I think in the past we've seen um, the, the women's game uses like a curling razor, and, and people don't, people don't bother coming down early, so they arrive right as it's finishing or in the gap between. So I think this is a better way of doing it. It's sort of um, I think it'll mean there's, there's more people in the stadium, and, and that's what they, they really deserve. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the stadium holds 9,215 people. Um, obviously, we, as a club, we have 25 free tickets for friends and family, which is really good. Thank you to London for doing that. Um, I don't know what London... I think London's Broncos capacities have been just over 1,000 people, and obviously, if, if you're listening and you can get down to Wimbledon for the day... Come down for both games. Like you're getting two games for the price you, for the price of one. It's gonna. It's not gonna cost you any more than it would just to come and watch one game at Wimbledon. I mean, if you're on a direct train into London and it's only gonna take you an hour and a half to get into London, you may as well make the extra half an hour to get across to the Cherry Red Record Stadium. Like, it's absolutely. It's gonna be an absolutely wonderful day, and you're gonna see. Unfortunately, in my opinion, I think you'll see Workington get relegated, which is which is not very good. Which is not very nice for them, especially with the form London are in at the minute. Obviously, being Newcastle forty four nil, but you're also going to get to see a really really tight game of women's rugby league, and it'll be not not to disrespect the army in the Cardiff game, but it'll be a hell of a lot closer. Yeah, and it will be it will just be a lot more entertaining. I think the Cardiff army game will be severely entertaining, and it will be great a great watch. And I'll watch it on our on our journey down, or while I'm sat watching the the Broncos Workington game, depending on what time I, I arrive. It's going to be an absolute cracking weekend, and I can't wait for the weekend after for the final. No matter who's in it, I want to make sure I get down there and and I watch it. And I, I believe it's in Cardiff. I believe the final is going to be at um, at the at Dragons RFC, which is just outside um, just outside Cardiff, I believe. For you, would you like to see, especially Cardiff? They, they've dismantled teams this year. I know they lost to London. Would you like to see? There's something that I listened on the forty twenty podcast which was earlier today Phil Kaplan yeah. he would like to see a the, the best of the Southern Conference League be entered into the normal Super League and play games against those teams every week um, you see the London Roosters doing it in wheelchair rugby so they have a, they have that's the sort of the best of the London wheelchair league um, I would like to see that happen in the women. I didn't agree with it. I didn't think it'd be very good because I think that gives more of an opportunity for players to get poached by bigger teams and potentially lose them. I know not many of the women's play and get. Uh, I'm sorry, not many of the women get paid. If any, I don't think any of them get paid to play. Yeah. But if they're offered good deals, especially with a lot of the girls being teachers and working in jobs that. Do you see? Do you see players like that being offered deals to move? If that is the yeah. situation, is that? Do you see it from my point of view, or do you think it is a good idea for maybe just a one-off, the best of Super League South, play the winner of the Super League Two or something? I bet. So just to just like to clarify, that is the idea that like the team that won it last year gets to play in a few games, or is it like the team that's currently at the top of the table? Or how how do you decide? I listened to what Phil Kaplan said. It's yeah. a select side from all of the teams in the South. So, ah, uh, so like a represent Kaz Colley in there. Uh, from, Bed from Bedford, you probably have Kaz Colley, Storm Cobain, Siobhan Drummond, just to name a few. Then from London, you probably have Kay Selby in there. From the Army, you probably get Kai Glynn in there. Uh, and there's there's loads of names like, uh, like yeah. 
you select them all and you put them all together and you take 17, 18, or however many you're allowed subs for them. I think we're allowed 20 subs. We're allowed 20 players in the Super League South, so you get seven subs. I don't know if you have a 20, 20 a side game over to Super, uh, over to play whoever wins this year, whether it be Saints, York, Wigan, Leeds, whoever wins Super League. You go and get them to play them in like a in a World Club Challenge style fixture. Um, yeah. Or do you get that team to go and play every other week in the Super League up north and try and see how they do against other... Right, so they're playing with each other every other week, but they're playing against each other in the weeks in between. Yeah, I don't like it. I think like you say, it's just a chance for um, players to get um, players to really. I, I think what I, what I like about the women's Super League South is that it feels like every match is, there's a bit of a rivalry because the two London clubs are... Like London versus Cardiff, the two capital cities, and yeah. it, it feels like um, it's like a, a smaller competition, so there's more of these sort of um, rivalries that happen. And, and also, you mentioned before about players that are, are moving teams, and all that adds interest and um, stuff. So, I think to like them, but like export the, the cream of the crop and dump them in a the league where nobody knows who they are, and it's they, they basically, it's like when you watch Catalan's play where there's like yeah. three people that play when they score um, and, and you've also got the fact that when like these, these players wouldn't be playing um, for their team as much maybe yeah. so then the values of the super big side and then you've got the fact that um, they might be thinking to themselves well I'm travelling up to the north of England every other week now I might as well get play for one of their teams and be in a like bigger um, competition and bigger yeah, and actually we have fans that follow me as well, like there's that to it. So I don't think it's a good idea. I think I think what's going on now in the women's super itself is actually um really good and really positive and it, if anything it should be protected to continue to allow it to, to grow rather than be exploited by these teams in the north of England that are, are actually doing fine for themselves and they don't need the, the extra games or whatever. No, I'm, I'm glad we're doing yeah. That's really good. That's, it's nice to, to hear a nice opinion and, and sort of hopefully Phil Kaplan listens to that and goes, actually, yeah, maybe I was a little bit wrong. It's an interesting idea, you know. You, you, I like the like, idea of the, 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 the one-off game. Don't get me wrong. I like that. Like you have, yeah. you have a representative side, so you call it the... He called it the Southern Bells. He just sort of brought it up on the spot. But you call it the Bedford... Bedford uh, the Betfred... Women's Super League South select versus, say, Wigan or Saints or whatever, and you get them into a camp for a couple of weeks. You get the coaches from all the sides sort of working together, so you get um, wars from the army. You get I don't know who the Cardiff head coach is. It, it um, and the London head coach. Their names was a CV, but you get Sam. You get wars. You get the head coaches all sort of come together. They go, okay, who's really impressed us this year? We've got Kaz at fullback. We have. Um, Someone on the wing, Kai Glynn and Shiv at centre. We've got uh, Greening and, and Ray, and you've got like this person, this, and you just go through. Do you know what I mean? I mean, off the top of my head, I could probably, if I went through match day squads and had a look, I could pick a 20 player squad. And I'd be like, okay, that, that team there, if they had uh, three weeks together, or they trained on a Wednesday or Thursday at the Ar Wednesday and a Saturday at the Army Stadium, and then oh, and went and played. Do you know what I mean? Or you could, you could organise it for the beginning of the, beginning of the following season. You could go and do something like that. I think that's a really good idea, but the mm. cost behind it would probably cost the R the RFL would probably have to put money behind it. And obviously, that's something that like, a conversation I could have with the RFL when I'm next there. So. Yeah, it's, like I think the, the, the cool idea is, and if, but, but my, my fear is that we create a lot of teams that don't really mean anything to anyone, and like waste resources on like promoting them. Yeah. Then we've got these like great brands like like. Some of these teams are only women's teams. There's no other association with them, so it's like a, a genuine, authentic new brand for the league, and they should be promoted more than say a select side that might, you know, might go for a few years, but then it fades into the background. It's almost like wasted um, energy. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, hundred percent. I agree with you. Um, we're an hour in, and we we we're going to move on to. 
our final thing because we were going to mention the Isaiah Papali uh, public question in his Tigers contract for next year. And I think with the backflipping that's going on with that, I think we're going to wait a couple of weeks to see exactly what happens because there's no guarantee yeah. that he's actually backflipped yet. So we're not going to discuss that um, this week. But we're, so we're going to move straight on to our set of six. And I believe it's still really tight at the top. The numbers off the top of my head, I've lost them. I can't find them. So I'm going to have to go back and we'll do an update at the end of at the start of the next podcast to do a thing, but we're, we're both still well ahead of Toby, and and he's already yeah. in. Uh, game number one, we mentioned it already, Penrith versus Melbourne. Uh, without Lit Cleary and, Lu- uh, and Luai, Melbourne are a really strong team. I know Pappenhausen's out, but Munster played at fullback uh, the other week and apparently ripped it up to shreds. Um, I, I wouldn't. I'd like to see it a little bit t- quite tighter at the top, and I'd like to see Penrith struggle a little bit. So I'm going to agree with Toby on this one. And I'm going to go Melbourne. I just love the way they're playing at the minute. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, and I think they show for the competition. Melbourne would be a more interesting win, but I'm going to I'm going to go with what I said earlier on um, um, the systems at Penrith are uh, winning for me. So I'm going to I'm going to go against to the um, first one for Penrith. Nice. Um, another game we've already mentioned. I think we've mentioned quite a lot. Of it. We've, I think we've mentioned actually all of these games this weekend um, coming up. Warrington versus Toulouse at Warrington. I love. I'd love if Toulouse won this game. I would love it if we beat them. I'm bringing out my Kevin Keegan right now. Um, I'm pretty sure it's Kevin Keegan that does that. Um, it might even be Warnock. I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> Toulouse, Toulouse have to win this game, don't they? And, and to even think about staying up. Yeah, this is a must win for them. It's probably the easiest win between now and the year, so they should be all geared towards this. They've been had a frustrating week last week. They um, should have beat Holker last week. They, yeah, they started off so well and then didn't see it out, so I feel like that'll eat away at them and make them train even harder and make them even more hungry for this. Um, and I think I think Warrington will be a Maybe a little bit, you know, they, they understand the, the ground of the situation, but I think they might be a bit complacent because I think they will catch up the points elsewhere and got a bit of a gap to them. Uh, yeah, I think, but they, I think Warrington know that they, the thing is they want to win this game, they know that they're going to, they're probably going to be safe, uh, depending on obviously on the, the Wakefield result, but it's like you said, it's only one up, one down. If to lose, lose, they've got three games to catch up potentially four, four points, and that's, that's a tough ask for them. Uh, for me, I think to lose, win this game, I think. Warrington, like you said, is probably a little bit complacent. They they back themselves to win more than just the one game. Yeah. Um, people are acting like it's just Wakefield and Toulouse that can go down. I'd love to see all them teams on the same amount of points in the last game of the season and none of them playing each other. That'd be absolutely like terrific for me. To be cool. Always, also gone with Toulouse. Are you making it a clean sweep for the, the team? Yeah, I, I'm going to go to Toulouse because I, I just want it to happen so much. Yeah, I think, we're, I think we're just praying it into existence. Um, game number three, Parramatta versus South Sydney. I think they're next to each other in a table. Um, both teams, I think, will be pretty safe in terms of their space in the top four. The Rabbitohs sit sixth, Parramatta sit fifth. Parramatta are two points ahead. The Rabbitohs win this game. They do go above them, and I think all but seal their spot in, in the playoffs. It's, do you think it's going to be a tight game? It's not one I think both teams think they're looking at and go, "Oh, we have to win this." Maybe the bunnies are looking at it and going, "Okay, we have to win this to make sure we don't drop to to eighth or even seventh or even ninth, depending on other risks." I don't think they can finish ninth, but I think they, if realistically they need to be looking at it and going, "Okay, we could be eighth after this if the Broncos win and the Roosters win. We're eighth, and if the Raiders win, we're only two points off not being in the playoffs." The Eels, on the other hand, they've got a little bit more comfort. They've got three points. They've got six points with four games to go ahead of the Raiders. So, re- in my eyes, they're in the playoffs, but they could, they could be really, really tight for, for them. Both teams won four of their last five. Uh, the Eels are at home, where their home form is not as good as the Rabbits, whereas the Rabbits' away form is awful. Where, where do you see this game being won and lost? Especially with, I think it's Moses out injured with a, with a hand injury at the moment. Yeah, I think... Um... I, I want to I take um, the Rebels for this one. Um, I just feel like uh, um, Paul and I sort of like had a bit of a revival from where they were over the last couple of years. Um, whereas the Rebel 
guys have got that could be my experience and when we get into these like closer end of season games, um I think we'll we'll see it out. I think the game breaker is always gonna be a trauma too. Yeah, um it seems to come back and find its form again, so yeah, I'm gonna bet the habits actually. Yeah, I think I'm gonna have to agree with, with Paramount being Never, not necessarily bottling it, but oh, that's it. They, they bottle it when it comes to sort of finals time, and it's getting close to that time now. And we know they're not going to be in a final. We know they're never going to win a final. Um, it's just one of them things that you get from the Matty John show if you watch it. Like you understand that they've only won. They've not. I don't think they've won it at all, have they? Ever. Um, the first um, time, a long, long time ago. Oh, did we get? We got. We were the team that Melbourne no beat and they. Uh, messed the cap. Yeah, they messed the cap. So technically, they technically. If you if you argue, people, I think people say they technically won it then. Yeah. Um. You look at this and you go, and oh, the Rabbitohs have to win this game, and the Trail Mitchell is going to run absolutely riot at, at that stadium. Um. Next up, we have. I've lost the list now. Um. Hokiar versus Leeds. We have next. Yeah. So we've got a Hokiar team that kind of scored a bit of a lucky win. Um, against Toulouse and Leeds Leeds win this week didn't they Leeds play this week yeah the thing is Leeds have got quite a few bands this week um, yeah ok I can't find the, 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 the band list now but I think Caesar's picked up a band I think uh, Discipline Tribunals here we go 9th of August uh, Aiden Caesar has won his appeal against too much expensive so he'll only miss one game um, so he's out for one match as well. Reese Martin is also out for one game. So and David Fusatura will miss two matches for Leeds. Whereas Hull KR are welcoming back a trio of players. So they're, they're sort of I know they their young lads got injured, but that's uh, is it Fishwick? Zach Fishwick, the seventeen year old prop, he's put in a massive shift for them lately. And I'd really like to see Hull KR get the win to that to, um, on Friday. Or Saturday, whenever it is, and also Hockey, I've just signed Tom Opacic for next year, so that's massive for them. Congratulations! Yeah, that is that's a, a, a pretty good sign, actually, isn't it? Um, yeah, I, I know you're saying, but I still think that um, Leeds have got the caliber of player to win this game. I know they haven't shown it this year all the time. I feel like they're, um, they're moving the right direction. I feel like Hockey are in their self. The ball seems to bounce their way, but um, if you go about logically, I think Leeds are the best side, so I'm not Leeds. Yeah, um, let's see who's returning. Harvey Moore and Corbin Sims drop out. Kane Lynette, Ryan Hall and Mikey Lewis all come back into the squad after recovering from their injuries, which is absolutely massive, especially um, Mikey Lewis. He, he absolutely runs that team. Yeah. Unfortunately, Lachlan Coop misses out after saying a, con- a concussion, so he's still out. Um, so he, he, him and Corbin Sims were obviously two massive losses, but their team looks a hell of a lot stronger, just adding those guys in. Obviously, PLT has been back at fullback, and he's been, in my opinion, he's actually been playing really well in terms of for, for an 18-year-old lad coming into Super League, playing his first game and game and a half. Um, I think just because I, I want to get a point ahead of you and move a little bit further on, I think I'm going to go to Hull KR this week. They, they haven't played badly when they've had no players. No. What's, what's necessarily let them down this year was getting rid of Tony Smith. Smith. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, now you've listed all those players coming back, I'm sorry we're getting by the season because... Do have time to change? I mean, Mike Lewis on his own is enough to take the scales. Um, I, I think he's quality. I think he's a game breaker and he's a winner. Yeah. Um, and Le- Leeds don't have oh, either Reese Martin or. Uh, I know. And also. David Fisatua. So there's three massive misses. Yeah, Danny McGuire coaching Hoka against Leeds. Yeah, yeah. big, big coaching uh, against the team. You will know exactly you know what they're as well. And they're a player, and also, like, everyone will want to win for them, won't they? And so that will give them a boost. Have time to change it. I mean, if I'm allowed to change, I've got, on the base of that knowledge, I've, I've got to change. You are allowed to change, yeah. Um, I'm back flipping. <laughs> this could really come back to bite you, but I really hope, hope it doesn't, because I've come for whole KR as well. <laughs> uh, now it's time for both those women's Super League South semi finals. Um, Cardiff travelled to Aldershot to play the Army, even though they're technically the home team. 
apart from their loss, their really close loss against London, where they didn't have as many ringers as they did against Bedford, but we won't talk about that. Um, the Army will have their big guns out for this game. Um, the Cardiff, Cardiff will also have a lot of their Welsh internationals available, I believe, for this game. I don't see Cardiff, and they've only conceded 32 points all year. 20 of those came against London. Like, so 12, 12 points over five games, four games. They've only conceded 12, 12 points over four games. That's, that's, that's crazy. Like, Bedford conceded, scored six of those. Like, I don't see, I don't see anything but a Cardiff win to that on, on Sat, on Sunday afternoon. Yeah, I, I agree. I think we're going to go the same way for both games, actually. I think, um, like you said, Cardiff seem unstoppable. Um, so, so many uh, players in that team that I know the name of. And I don't know many women Super League so, players, so um, I'll, always, I'll always back them. And for, and for the last game, I know which way they're going to go. I don't know if you do, but go on. Oh, no, <laughs> no, I'll let, I'll, let, I'll let you introduce it, I'll let you introduce um, it. I'll, I'll tell you first, uh, Toby's gone for Leeds for the game before, he's gone for Cardiff for the game against the Army, and he's also gone for Bedford for the semi-final. The way the girls trained tonight as of time of recording, they look really good, they, they, they look prepared, a lot of the girls know exactly how they're getting there, like, we're, we're apparently getting there a bit early, we're watching a game, we're relaxed, like, everything's being oh. organised. And I re and I know, I know for a fact that Bedford can go to Wimbledon and they can beat London. I know they can, and I know, no, I say they. I know we can. Like yeah. I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna be working on the day, and I know we. And it's in front of the R League cameras. I really, really hope that we can go to the, London and beat London, and then go and play Cardiff. I know we're gonna travel to Cardiff and play Cardiff again because Cardiff will win, but. I pray to the Lord that Bedford can win at the weekend, and I'm going to go for Bedford because it's just it's just going to be such a close game. It really is, and like if I was a, if there was betting available on it, and I was allowed to bet on it, which I'm not because of my my role in the RFL, um, or my, my renewed role in the RFL, I should say, back on the youth board. Um, if I was allowed to, I would I wouldn't put money on this game. Because it's just so, it's too close to call. I wouldn't, I would, just wouldn't do it. I wouldn't touch it. I wouldn't touch it because one, I would never bet on, never bet on or bet against or for a team that I support. It just, it's not something that I like to do. But also, I know what London can turn up with. I also know what Bedford can turn up with. We, I know who's missing for us in terms of sort of who can't be there which is uh, Storm's not available because of a broken wrist and uh, Ray Taylor one of our halfbacks is not available but the halfbacks we had out training tonight look really good Nikki's not available but Zoe's been absolutely outstanding when she's filled in at nine the in terms of the forwards we've got available our, the, our one of forward pack is going to it's going to deal with deal with London's forward pack I think it's just when you're, not, you're selling it mate. you're selling it I'm trying yeah. to make you go for for London just because I want a point off you but oh <laughs> I know I, I was always picking big in this one it's coming it's, it's semi-final time I, I've got a, a long history now with this club I've been a, a, a long lifelong supporter of Bedford uh, long before I even knew you <laughs> <laughs> But no, seriously, I, I think I think you I think you know you know best. You know, you're, you're in the camp. You see how how the girls are joining, and um, the fact that you're making a, an afternoon of it makes me feel like the heads in the right place. The calm, the ready for this. Yeah, um, and we want revenge. Like we've played London three times and lost three times, but every time we've played better and better and better. And the, the only reason they beat us this season, I think, in my eyes, was because we just didn't have the rotation that they had. We didn't have players available, but this squad we've got this weekend can go there and do a number on them. And the prep that Sam and Phil and Dan, the coaching team, have put in this afternoon and the weeks leading up to it and the sessions leading up to this has been absolutely outstanding. And I really hope that it pays off for them and Rob and everyone else involved off the field. I really hope that the, the, the plans that have been put in place and the preparation of this season and the last season, not obviously not winning a game at all last season, it will really kick, kick the girls forward and, and this is the chance for us to make a, our first major final in, in only our second season as a women's team so 
I really hope that the girls can go over to Wimbledon and, and smash them. And if you can't, yeah, make it, yeah. Yeah. those that are listening and watching slash listening on YouTube, if you can't make it to London, watch the game on our league. It's free. It is free. Like the game before, you've got to pay four ninety five to watch London versus Workington. Feel free to pay for that. Watch that if you want to watch it. If you can't make it, but watch the um, uh, London Broncos versus Bedford Tigers Women's Super League South semi final on Sunday. You won't be disappointed. It's going to be an hour and a half of pure, like enter- entertaining, just rugby league. It's just going to be absolutely fantastic to watch. I can't wait. I'm definitely going to set an alarm for it so I can see them. Also, I commentated on the last time Bedford Tigers were on our league, so you might hear me. I don't know. You might, I've not you might hear a, a slightly biased comment to it. No, no, never, 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 never. I'm just <laughs> excited when we score. Never biased. Um, but can I say, though, what, what a like, great insight that you'd be able to bring to you when we've got uh, someone like Brad who's, who's gets to see you in the workings and the, and the machine and report back to us on these clips for, uh, for the upcoming fixtures. Also, if you're around, Great, I love it. If you're around the Bedford area on Saturday, get yourself down to Putney Woods and watch Bedford Tigers beat North Hearts and all but secure a playoff spot. Um, so yeah, that'll be really good. We've got we've got a couple of more weeks to go. We've still got plenty of rugby coming up for for the the community game. I know there was a lot of community cup finals and league finals that happened over the weekend, and West Hull won the national comp- one of the national conference titles. So congratulations to them. Uh, Beverly, I believe, won a title as well. So congratulations to them. But there was some absolutely cracking community rugby league still going on, and it will go on up until I believe nearly the end of November once you get the the conference league fixtures out of the way. Um, but no, that's that's the end of this week's pod, Rob. That's gone really quick. So yeah, that's gone quick. I can't believe what time it is. <laughs> it's eleven forty-five on a Wednesday night. I have now. I'm awake now. Let's go and let me go and edit this. So I've got it ready to go tomorrow. Because um, if it's out late, I do apologise. Um, we'll put out a post if it ends up being out late. If it has to come out on Friday morning, it has, it has to come out on Friday morning. But I'll do my very best. Hopefully, you're all listening to this at five thirty on Thursday afternoon. Um, but no, thank you very much for joining me, Robin. Um, I thank believe, you. I believe we'll be back in two weeks' time, and I believe Toby will be back. I'm just going to check the Derby games because if he's not, I'm going to make sure he's around. Let's check Derby's fixtures, shall we? I don't know why he can't be in life from the game. You know, we, we've got Holmes these days. He can just bang over that. What's the date in two weeks' time? The twenty third. Oh, he's not even a rat. Derby to versus TBC in the cup. Did they win the cup game? Yeah, it's against. Oh, for God's sake! TBC FC. Yeah, they won. They won the bloody cup. They won in the cup. Who have they got next Tuesday? They've got West Brom or Sheffield United. Oh, they, there's no point. They're going to be at home, so he's not going to be there. So we'll record Wednesday in two weeks' time as well. Uh, but no, thank you very much for joining me once again. Sorry for those on YouTube that are just looking at our logo while you're listening to this. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks' time when we'll discuss the world of rugby league in two weeks' time, and maybe. Maybe I might have the Super League Women's South trophy behind me next in, in two weeks' time. Who knows? Oh, we can dream. Who knows? I'll be dreaming and I'll be praying for it. And I'll try and try and make sure you guys can see it. Um, but no, thank you very much for having me, Robin. We've been the Biff, brought to you by Swinging Arms and Shoulder Charges. And we'll catch you in, in a fortnight. Thank you very much for having us.